Lord today. Amen. I am so thankful that you're here, so thankful for the presence of the Lord in this room. And I am grateful that we have been blessed to be able to assemble together one more time and to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords together. I'm so honored this morning to have the privilege to stand behind this sacred desk and to share the word of the Lord with you one more time as well. Those of you going to class, feel free to do so at this time, but those in the sanctuary today, I'm going to take you many places in Scripture for the next few moments, if the Lord would help me. Uh, but I want us to begin in the book of Numbers, chapter number 6 this morning. The book of Numbers, chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 22 through 27, is where we're going to start from today. Those of you taking notes this morning, make sure your pencil's sharp or your ink is full of lead. All right? Uh, our ink is, that, I messed that all up, didn't I? I need a little bit more sleep. So, and, uh, but uh, I am so thankful uh, that we can stand and share for a few moments this morning. Uh, if you was here on Wednesday, Please stay with me. I'm just going to recap very quickly uh, some of the things that I shared on Wednesday. This is just a continuation of Wednesday. I'm not going to re-preach or re-teach what I taught on uh, Wednesday, but it is just to bring everybody to the place that we're all on the same page this morning. Uh, if the Lord would help me, I'm going to teach for a few moments, maybe preach for a few moments on the commanded blessing today. And uh, there is three areas in our lives uh, that we know that there is a commanded blessing where God will command the blessing. Uh, and uh, that is where his people are obedient, where there's obedience with his people, where there is the lifestyle or the behavior of giving as well as being in a place of unity. On Wednesday evening, we dealt with a place of unity. I'm not going to re-preach that this morning, but we will revisit some of that just in a moment. Uh, but in, I want to give you the commanded blessing uh, so we can begin together this morning. Uh, in Numbers chapter number 6, the Lord is speaking to Moses. He's giving him instructions. And he says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons on this manner. And ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. This is the commanded blessing. Now, when we look at the commanded blessing, it is something that we could talk about for many weeks and go into many different areas. But I want to take you now and give you what I think most of us are, uh, are aware of. In Psalms chapter 1, you find these words, Blessed is the man that walked not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and doth he meditate day and night. It says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. As I shared with those that was here on Wednesday night, I want to be that man. I want to walk in the favor of God, the blessing of God. I, I want there to be increase in our life. I, I'm not here to teach or talk and preach about prosperity this morning but how many knows God wants us to be prosperous people he wants us to be blessed people not so we can be hoarders but so that we can continue to advance the kingdom and bless others it's not my message today but I want you to understand with me that a commanded blessing it is a promise of God that conveys within itself the irrevocable power to bring it to fulfillment or to bring it to pass. 
the commanded blessing is simply a promise of God that says I don't need anything else added to this but when I speak it that's the way it's going to be how many knows that God's word is full of power let us at the very beginning of our time together understand this Romans 13 1 and 2 tells us let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God the powers that be are ordained of God Wheresoever therefore resist, whoever therefore resisteth the power, they resist the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. When we begin to walk contrary to the word of God or the authority of God, we begin to walk in a manner where we begin to become men and women that begin to walk towards destruction instead of life. Now, when we establish this simple fact and truth that God is the ultimate authority and that if his word has power and authority, and you say, how do we really know that to be true? If you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and just begin to read in your Bibles, you will find, and God said, let there be. And whatever he said, there was. And then he looked at it and he said, and it is good. But then when he got to man, he said, let us make man in our likeness and our image. And then he saw, he said, and it was good, but he said it was very good. So when God begins to speak in his authority, in his power, in his authority, there is nothing that is able to trump that. And therefore, when he says there's going to be certain areas or certain things that I speak concerning, it, there's nothing that's going to be able to stop that from being. So when we're gearing into the realm of humanity today, and I began to look where we're at, and the Lord began to bring me back to some of the basic principles. I find that the only thing that keeps us from the things that God has promised is ourselves. Because humanity in its fallen state often will go contrary to the promises of God and the word of God in such a manner. And we find that all throughout the history of Israel, when they walked in a manner where they kept his statues and obeyed his commandments, they was blessed. But when they began to walk away from those things, they began to experience cursings. Now, as I said just a few moments ago, there's three areas when you begin to talk about the commanded blessing that is covered throughout Scripture. We find in Numbers chapter 6, he's dealing with his people, the children of Israel. You can take all of the replacement theology of our day and throw it in the trash the church has never replaced Israel or the children of Israel, the Jewish people, nor will we ever. The Jewish people are still the apple of God's eye. They are special people. They are gifted people. There is something about them that cannot be said about any other race of people. When you look at the creativity, the blessing in their mind in many areas, some of the greatest and some of the most vital things that has ever been brought into the realm of humanity has came from the mind of the Jews. Their creativity is off the scale. It is unbelievable how God has favored them, especially with inventions and all types of things. The, some of the most life-saving things that we have today has came from the Jewish people. But we must never forget that we are grafted in we are the, the church. We are sons and daughters of Abraham. And we are grafted in. We have never replaced them, nor will we ever. But we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Let us never forget that. So therefore, the commanded blessing that is spoken over the children of Israel is a spoken and commanded blessing that is over the church of Jesus Christ in this hour. The second thing is this we find in Psalms 133 and I use this on Wednesday evening. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment and the dew of Hebron and, and the, as of the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion for there the Lord commanded the blessing even life forevermore. When men and women get into a place of unity, unity with the word of God as well as unity with one another, it is a place where there is a commanded blessing. 
And that's why, as I shared, I won't re-preach it or reteach it this morning. But you and I today must understand, as busy as life is, you and I today as the church of Jesus Christ cannot be too busy. We have got to make sure that we safeguard and that we build relationships with our Father as well as one another. The word of the Lord is very clear. When you see the evil day in which we're living, we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but he says do it the more so. That's why we have to understand this has not been critical, but this has been real. This has been totally transparent and honest with you. There is men and women that I have a heart for God, but their behavior today is going contrary to the word of God. We now have Sunday, mo Sunday morning service and that's it. We're closing the doors of the sanctuary on Sunday night and Wednesday night and every other day through the week because everything else is a priority. We are going to have to reevaluate our lives. I'm not saying you have to be at the house of God every time the doors is open. But I'm saying if you can be, you should be because the word of the Lord says that when you see the evil day, you should not forsake the assembling of yourself, but you should do it the more so. Why? He said because if you're in a place where unity is, and how many knows you cannot be unified, you cannot be with one another and be what we need to be if you don't do life with each other. And that's why God is saying you gotta, you got to be in unity with my word and with my will, but also with your brethren. Notice uh, Abram is a perfect example of that. Uh, when he was walking with Lot and the herdmen uh, began to have strife between them and he goes and he calls Lot and you can read it in Genesis 13, 7 and 8. He says, listen, we're brethren. Don't let any strife be between us. Uh, he said, you pick out the place. Uh, you go the direction. I'll go the other. We don't want opposition. We're, we're not competitors uh, but we are family. There's something deeper uh, that, than a little bit of water or a little bit of grass in a field. There's got to be a bond that cannot be broken. Uh, and we find that and, and then you read in Hebrews 13, 1 and 2, it says this, let brotherly love continue. Don't be, don't, don't be uh, so bogged down that you lose the focus uh, and you don't walk in this love that I have continually. Uh, and you go and you look at this and you say, well, where does all of this fit? If you go to Proverbs 4, verse number 7, it says, wisdom is the principal thing and all you're getting of wisdom also get understanding. We are in a place today, in America especially, that we have got to come back to living a life of principles because principle living is the recipe to experiencing the blessing and the favor of God. We can talk about it, we can pray about it, uh, we can try to work it up, we can try to shout it down, all of these things. It will not happen. You and I today must realize uh, that if we are going to operate under the commanded blessing of God, then there is a principal lifestyle that has to be lived. That means this, as men and women of God, our first priority is to get wisdom, understanding, and to then go to Proverbs 23 and 23, and it says, buy the truth and sell it not. Meaning this, no matter what I discover through the revelation knowledge of God by the Holy Spirit, if, if, if I look at it, if I hear it, if I see it, and even if my flesh resists it and don't like it, I cannot get rid of it. I have to keep it, and I have to begin to have my life molded into that manner so that I'm walking, pleasing, and trusting in the sight where I'm trustworthy in the sight of God. Now we know with wisdom been the principal thing, wisdom takes us to a place of greater understanding and greater understanding and wisdom of the word of God always takes you to a place of unity as well as a place of obedience. Uh, and you and I today must realize that obedience is still better than sacrifice. We find if you read 1 Samuel chapter number 15, Saul was anointed to be king uh, and then the word of the Lord comes and through the prophet Samuel and he says, I've given Saul a charge. I want him to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. I don't want you to spare anything. But we find upon when you read chapter number 15 that they began to look at the good that the Amalekites had and they began to bring back and they did not utterly destroy. And the Lord said this, it repenteth me 
that I have made Saul king. And therefore, he said, I am going to remove the kingdom from him. Notice with me, because of his disobedience, uh, Saul lost his place of authority and therefore he was not able to fulfill that which God had entrusted him with. He lost his throne, he, therefore he lost his authority. Today, the church in America, we as the church globally, we have been given kingdom authority. But the reason that we are not seeing uh, the operation of the Holy Spirit in the manner that we desire to see it is because uh, that we are not living lives of obedience. Therefore, we are not walking with kingdom authority. Now, when I began to look at all of these things uh, and, and I began to look at how important unity is and how important it is to walk in, in, in a place of obedience, uh, I am also brought back where I'm going to focus just for a few moments this morning. But before I go any further, I want you to look at your neighbor this morning and I want you to help me preach because I think they'll probably listen to you better than they will this morning to me, okay? So I just want to make, I want you to make this declaration for me. Tell your neighbor, say, the pastor or the preacher, he doesn't want your money. Okay, let's just get that settled this morning, all right, right now. Now, you, now, now, now sometimes teaching is, is, is the best recipe, so turn it and, and tell them one more time. I want them to really get this this morning. Tell them the preacher doesn't want your money this morning, okay? Okay, now I can get to my message, all right? Because what, where I'm taking you now, is a place of principal living. And, and, but how many want, let, before I go any further, how many wants to be blessed by God? But how many wants to live under the commanded blessing of God? See, we know what it takes to be blessed. We have to walk in obedience to the word of God. We have to live a life that is set apart. We understand that. You don't need me to teach that or preach that to you this morning. We know we're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to be set apart. All these things. You all have heard that all of your life. And, and, but, but we got to go beyond that because it's one thing to be blessed but it's another thing to have a commanded blessing and, and that's what I want you to understand God, we're, we're blessed right now whether you realize it or not you are blessed like we are extremely blessed I'm sitting amongst the most wealthiest people on this planet you know, I have friends that, that, that are working for $12 a week, okay? Uh, and, and I've been in their homes, and, and when I go to their homes, I sit on a five-gallon bucket or, or, a, or a chair that somebody drug out of the trash. Uh, listen, uh, we're blessed. You, you, you didn't have to worry about if it rained last night that water was going to run down by your mattress that was laying on the dirt uh, and there was just a trench beside it. Listen, I, I've been there. I have, I have men and women that I've set in their homes and that's what it is. We are extremely blessed. But even beyond the blessings that we have today, there is a commanded blessing that takes us to a new realm and a different place. And that commanded blessing that God has comes when we dwell and live in a place of unity, when we live and dwell in a place of obedience, as well as when we come to a place where we are completely willing to give not some things, but everything. Now, Malachi chapter number 3 and as everybody groans as I go there, you'll be all right, promise, I promise. Malachi chapter 3, beginning of verse number 6 through verse number 12. Let me read this to you. It's for, it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinance and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? He says, in tithe and offering. You all are nervous right now. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. 
and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and ye shall not destroy the and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now I want to take a few moments this morning and I want to look at this because please hear me. We are in a place right now where we are dealing with a generation that is living under a curse because of the simple fact they do not understand what it is to live a principled life and a disciplined life. Now, we find that, yes, we understand we have to walk in obedience we, in every area of our life. We understand that unity is important. But please me, please understand, if we're ever going to walk in unity and if we're ever going to walk in a place of obedience, then we're going to have to first come back and get this part of life because this is entry level. And that is Malachi chapter 3, understanding that when we began to walk around and live our lives with close fist, we began to walk in a manner where the commanded blessing cannot be present in our life. Now, I want us to understand today, if you go back to Scripture, we're not the first generation that's ever dealt with this opposition. If you go to Haggai chapter number 1 and you read verses 2 through 11, you will find that the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai and he begins to speak to a group of people that found themselves in opposition. Every time they had started trying to rebuild the temple, there was opposition that came. Things that kept kind of trying to come around and defeat them. And therefore, they said this, now is not the time for us to build the Lord's house. But the word of the Lord came by the prophet saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie in waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. Notice, he said, you've sown much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, and you're not filled. You're clothed, but none of you is warm. You earn wages, uh, but it's like you put them in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse number 8, he says, go up to the mountain, bring wood, build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. Now we understand he's talking about a natural building there. But let me bring you to New Testament scripture and remind you that Paul said, know you not that you are the temple of God, you are the Holy Spirit, we, by the whole, that this is the place of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple today. But in order for us to build this temple, then we are going to have to be a man or a woman that is willing to build it in a manner that is in alliance with the word of God and we do that by being and cooperating in the manner that God has set for us to do. Number one of that is of giving of ourselves. We are to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Didn't say occasionally, but it said daily. Now, one of the greatest struggles that humanity has is that of finances. It causes more issues in homes, more issues in marriages, more issues in life, and even more issues in church. Now, we have been a blessed people. We're a blessed ministry. Those of you sitting in this room, this is an area that I don't ever speak of. And the reason I don't is because God has always taken care of it and I give God praise and glory for that. And we are a blessed ministry today because that you operate and you give and you do what God places in your heart. And as a pastor, I am very grateful for that. But please hear me. There are men and women today that are in a state of struggle, they are in a state of lack, they are in a state of great opposition and it seems like everything they are doing comes to naught because of the simple fact they have failed to operate and set their life in order in such a manner that the commanded blessing is present in their life. Notice with me, you and I today have got to understand and we have to understand and establish this fundamental principle that we are not owners of anything. We are stewards. 
God is the owner of all things. Now with God being the owner of all things, therefore we are simply stewards and that means we are accountable to God with everything that he gives us, everything that bring, he brings into our life. Now, I, I go by this simple method, three, the, the three T's. We have to be good stewards over the three T's of our life. Number one is simply this, our time. Number two is our talent. And number three is our treasure. So therefore, when I begin to talk about giving, I am not just merely talking about a tithe or an offering in financial terms. But I'm talking today that we are dealing with a generation that is so consumed with life and everything else that we fail to understand it is important. Yes, we understand we are to give a tithe of that which is brought into us. I don't think we dispute that in this house at all. But we also are to be men and women that brings alms or offerings. Those offerings can be financially, get financial gifts, or they can be the giving of our time, they can be the giving of our talents, the giving of our treasures, the thing that God has brought into our lives. But please hear me. We have to understand that even when it comes to giving, there is principles that God has put in place. And we have a generation that does not fully understand that, and therefore the commanded blessing is not upon them. What does this really mean when I talk about a commanded blessing? In order for us to really understand why it is important to live a life where the commanded blessing is present in our life, you have to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 28, verses 1 through 8. Let me give them to you very quickly. It says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee, and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall thou be in the city. Blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall, thou, shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, with that been said, please hear me. I want to give you just some basic principles. I'm not, going to, I'm not preaching a shouting message this morning. But I'm bringing us to a place where I believe in my spirit. The Lord told me recently. He said, if my people are ever going to experience what I'm desiring to release over them, then they're going to have to come back to principle living. Now, now remember what your neighbor told you this morning. You, the, the preacher don't want your money, okay? But listen, you and I have got to understand that he expects us to give. Now, giving an offering is wonderful, but you will never experience a return on your offering or increase in your offering unless you are someone that is disciplined in a manner where you are tithing or giving back what belongs to God. Now, I, I don't care if it's a dollar, the amount doesn't matter, whether you're tithing on a dollar or whether you're tithing on a million. The amount does not matter. But you as an individual, as a man of God, a woman of God, have to understand that principle living is the key to the commanded blessing. And therefore, it's real easy to give a tithe on $5 because it's not going to cost you much. But when God brings a greater blessing in your life and he blesses you exponentially and then you have to write not a 50 cent check, but then you have to start writing a $5,000 check. How many knows that stings a little bit? Let's just be honest and real. But it's the same principle because the tithe belongs to the Lord. Now there's been great debates over this over the years. Well, the tithe was under the law, but it was before the law. You can go to Genesis and you'll find that Abraham tithed. Uh, we find Jacob tithed. And I can give you scriptures and verse for all of those things. 
but then we find that the tithe was under the Mosaic law. But then we find that Jesus comes in Matthew 23, verse number 23, and he talks to the Pharisees and the scribes and says, listen, you all are a bunch of hypocrites. You're saying, oh, I bring the tithe and this, but you're not keeping the other parts of the law. You're, you're not dealing with grace. You're not dealing with mercy. You're not dealing with faithfulness. Uh, you're not doing all of that. But he said, you've got to pay attention to that. But also don't neglect the former as well, which is don't, don't forget to bring the tithe. So, so Jesus himself validates it. But if you are going to be someone that tithe, please hear me, you're giving to God. But that means that you've prepared your atmosphere or your land for greatness because now you're prepared for a commanded blessing. But it's not enough just to sit down and write a check and say, well, I did what I was, what was, listen, we don't give out of duty. We get out of love and out of cheerfulness. New Testament scripture said give cheerfully. But I give back to God what is his. Why do I do that? I did not understand this for many years, but then I began to understand it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I am blessed today because of the simple fact that I continue to try to live my life every day to be a blessing. Now, but when I began to understand that when I gave the tithe, what I did, I began to set the stage for the Lord to begin to speak on my behalf. But notice what happens. When I begin to give the tithe, now I am positioned to give an offering. And when the offering is given, whether it be of my time, of my treasure, or of my talent, it begins to be the seed that goes into the ground. And therefore now the tithe is protecting my offering no matter what it was, and then the devourer is not able to come in and steal it. But now we have people that says, well, I can't afford to give what really belongs to God, so I won't give my tithe, but I'll give a $5 offering. But every time, or I give a $100 offering or a $10 offering, but what they don't understand is there was no tithe, there was no principal living, there was nothing protecting it. So then the devourer comes in and he picks up that $5 seed and then you say, I don't understand why nothing's growing in my life. It's because there's no principle in your life where the commanded blessing can be present. Listen, the reason that I am blessed today and the reason that God has blessed me and my family today, and I don't say this in a braggatious way, is because I have become someone that is disciplined and principled living. And, and listen, I said, Lord, I, I don't have time to live in lack. I don't have time to live in, in, in disarray and chaos uh, because God, I, I, there's work that needs to be done. So therefore, I have, you got to show me. you got to teach me. Uh, and he began to teach me through the word and I began to realize, you know, when, when I give a tithe, wonderful. I'm giving to God. I haven't even gave yet. I just gave God what was his. But then when I began to start giving the offering when I began to start giving that $20 to the one that needed it or I began to meet somebody else's need or I began to give of my time or my talent uh, and, and I began to give that for the kingdom uh, I began to see that the enemy no longer was able to come in and just pull those things back out of my field uh, but there began to be a harvest uh, and the next thing I know I didn't have to worry about how I was going to put gas in my car next week uh, but I began to operate and live in a realm uh, that I never had because there was a commanded blessing on my life uh, uh, the Lord began to, I began to find that I was blessed going in, uh, I was blessed going out, uh, I was blessed going here and I was blessed going there. Listen, uh, I know what it is to go to the house uh, and walk to the mailbox and find a check in the mail. Uh, I said, praise the Lord. Uh, listen, uh, I know what it is for somebody. Uh, listen, when we was building this building, uh, I didn't know what in the world I was getting myself into. Uh, other than this, I gonna need a whole lot of money and I didn't have a whole lot of money uh, and I said, Lord, uh, we're not gonna go upside down in debt but Lord, if it, this is in my heart and if it's you, it's going to happen. Uh, I'd be in here working all by myself. Uh, I would gave of my tithe. Uh, I would gave my offering. Uh, but then I would gave of myself, uh, my talent, what little it is. Uh, I was in here driving nails. Uh, I, I was in here feeling alone sometimes. And all of a sudden, uh, God sends somebody down the road. Uh, they'd pull in the parking lot. Uh, they say, we don't know why we're here other than we was praying. The Lord said, uh, we need to come. Uh, and here, and I got an envelope of money. I got a check full of money. Uh, uh, listen, all of this stuff happened. I said, what in the world going on? Uh, I said, I think I'll just work on the building a little longer. Uh, why? Uh, it's because uh, there was a commanded blessing. Uh, what I'm telling you this morning is this. Uh, we have a generation uh, that is in chaos today. Uh, there's families uh, that you're putting everything you do uh, in bags with holes. Uh, you're in a place of lack. Uh, you're in a place where there's not enough. Uh, and it's not because you're doing a bunch of stuff 
life wrong or because the devil uh, has power in your life. Uh, it's simply because of the simple fact the Lord says, uh, I can't do what I'm desiring to do uh, until you come into alignment. Uh, get to a place of obedience. Uh, get to a place of unity. Uh, but also get to a place where you're willing to give uh, not just something, uh, but give everything. Uh, you say, but you don't know my situation. I can't afford to give. Uh, listen, uh, you cannot afford not to give. Uh, I'm not talking about your money. Uh, I'm talking about you cannot afford to not give uh, to the local church uh, your time, your talent, uh, and your treasure. Uh, listen, uh, I understand today uh, that there's a lot of stuff going on, uh, but listen, uh, the gospel uh, is very clear uh, that we are to be men and women uh, that have open hands and open hearts. Uh, when your hand is closed, God can't put anything in it. And when we are walking around with closed fist lives, we are getting ourselves to a place where the blessing cannot be commanded over us. What is that? As I said earlier, it is the promise of God that carries within itself the irrevocable power to bring it to fulfillment. That's why he can take little and make it much. That's why he can take a willing vessel and turn it into something that turns a world upside down. When you look at the 120 individuals that went to the upper room in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, you don't see the greatest of society. You see everyday average men and women that was with a few hundred more that seen Jesus ascend to the heavens. But he said this, go to Jerusalem and tarry there because not many days from now you'll be endued with power. Ordinary average men, women. But they walked into a place of obedience they got into a place of unity because it says in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, that was in one mind and one accord. But listen, you find a picture there that was a group of people that was obeying the command of God. They got into a place of unity, but then there was a group of people that was giving of themselves. They didn't pass an offering plate. But what they was doing, they was giving of their time. They was giving of their talent. They was giving of their treasure because of the simple fact it was costing them to sit there because they wasn't working. Hadn't been to work for 10 days. Don't try that today. Without permission, you'll get fired. So they gave of their treasure. They went, listen, notice that they went a week and a half, didn't work, so that means they weren't getting a paycheck next Friday. That was a sacrifice. They gave of their talents, meaning this, they wasn't operating in their, in their giftings or their callings at that moment because they, they, they gave everything since everything's set aside and their time. They stayed there. But when they become givers of their time, their talent, and their treasure, there was a release of the commanded blessing says the Holy Spirit sat down upon them and they began to speak with cloven tongues like his fire. Notice what happened. They turned the world upside down. Why did they turn the world upside down? It's because they was operating under the commanded blessing. There was others that saw Jesus ascend but nothing, you read of nothing of happening after that in their life. But of the 120, we follow many of their lives and we find that when you get just a few chapters over it says these are they that have turned the world upside down. There's some things in your life that look so big, some mountains that look so tall, valleys that look so wide, and the enemy has sat on your shoulder and said, you'll never get beyond that, you'll never reach that place, you'll never get to that level, you'll never become that. You're not smart enough, or you're not talented enough, or you're not this, or you're not that. And you sit there and you believe those things. And because you believe that, 
instead of what the word says he says I'm giving you basic instructions before leaving earth in your Bible that will take you to a place where you're blessed going in and blessed going out if you just follow them but the enemy understands that if they ever get to a place where they fully trust him if they ever get to a place where they bring everything and lay it at his feet then there's going to be a commanded blessing and, and I, I don't have any authority to stand in their life go back to Deuteronomy and read it again chapter number 28 it's not just about being blessed in the city and blessed in the field and everything you own been blessed but it's about the simple fact the Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before you. Is it possible you're fighting the same devil today that you did six months ago, the same issue six months ago, because you just haven't been willing to give of your time, your talent, and your treasure to the kingdom? Well, I'm too busy. I can't go to prayer meeting. Or I'm too busy. I can't, I can't take 30 minutes to, to stop and to disciple someone or to speak into someone's life. I, I just got too much going on. Listen. Every day that God gives us is a gift and we are to use that gift wisely and that means every day we take our time, our talent, our treasure and we invest it not in the things of this world but we invest it into the kingdom of God so that others can be blessed so that others can hear the message of Christ. Listen, the commanded blessing has been hindered today in this very moment of time because of the absence of obedience, unity, and giving. I want to leave you with this this morning. The American church needs men and women just like you to become re-engaged in the local church where the local church can once again become the place that begins to shine brightly for the community in which it's in. Where when people find themselves in crises, they say, you know what, we can go to the house of the Lord because there's people there that's able to meet our need. There will be no anointing. There will be no great revelation. There will be no great harvest at any local church or local ministry until the people in that ministry began to live in a manner where the commanded blessing was spoken over them. And the only way that Lord can speak the commanded blessing over this house or any other house is when the people in that house began to live an obedient life where they live and walk in unity with him and one another and where they don't give him some things but where they give him everything. time, the talent, the treasure. This morning, as they come to the music, please. What we see in many places today is this very picture of the kingdom of Saul taking place right now. Notice with me. When Samuel came back to Saul, and he said, why have you not obeyed the voice of the Lord? And he said, we have. He said, I have fulfilled the command of the Lord. And he said, then why do I hear the bleeding of the sheep in my ears? Immediately he began to try to give a explanation. Well, we're going to do this and this and this. And he said, that's not what the Lord said. He said, I'm not going to come back and see you anymore because the Lord is removing his hand off of you and the Sam, Samuel began to turn and Saul fell down and grabbed his garment and rent it tore it and the man of God turned and said that's exactly what the Lord has done to you today because of your disobedience I've, he's rent the kingdom from you but notice for many days, many months, and for a few more years, Saul still walked to the palace, still walked to the throne room, and still sat on a throne. But he didn't have any authority. He didn't have any heavenly authority. 
There's a lot of people today that still go into the house of God. They're still saying they're spirit filled and they're still this and they're still that. They're still trying to give a prophetic word or they're still trying to operate in the gifts of the spirit. But really they don't have any power, any authority because the Lord has not spoke that commanded blessing over them. Because there's disobedience, because there's no unity, because there's no giving. I know today I could list you. I could list you today. A list of men and women of God that has a heart to do something great. But the ministries that God has set them over and in is in a place of crises because of divisions amongst the people because of disobedience to not been willing to operate in gifts and callings and because men and women have closed their wallets and closed their lives and said well please don't fall out with me but this event that event that event and that event and this child's activity here and activity there has taken all of our time and now we say we don't have time we we'd love to pray but we don't have time to pray We'd love to help do some maintenance, but I just don't have time to do some maintenance. I, I'd, I'd love to go knock on doors with you, preacher, but I just, I just don't have time. And Listen, we've made all these excuses. And then we wonder why our families are in shambles today. We wonder why the houses of worship are all boarded up and closed. Listen, this generation needs to see the manifestation power of the Holy Spirit of God. They don't need to see another religious activity, but they need to see the glory of God. And you and I are going to answer before Him, not man, but we're going to stand before Him and we're going to have to give an answer to why the next generation that we've given birth to does not experience God if we don't get it right now. And I'm here to tell you tonight, or this morning, that we got to get back to a place of obedience. We got to get back to where we're in unity with one another. And we got to get back to a place where we're willing to give. We got to get back to where we're willing to give a tithe and an offering. Listen, I want you to be blessed. I'm not trying to bring something hard on us today, but I'm here to tell you it works. You can't outgive God. I don't give to get. But I just know this, that when I do give, I am going to get because there is a spoken blessing over my life. I had the privilege to sit at the feet of B.H. Clendenin two years before he passed away. He stood before me and several other ministers and he said, Pastors, you listen to me and you listen to me well. And he took that finger and he pointed it at us. He said, the last 15 years of my life, $16 million has come to this hand. He said, I know that entices some of you, but he said, here's the, here's the deal. He said, $16 million come to this hand, but $16 million went out this one. You're just a conduct. God's blessed you. Continue to be a blessing so more blessings come so you can bless others. Listen, I, I, I know what it's like to, to struggle to give, but also know what it's like to be blessed to give and blessed to give and I'm here to tell you today the commanded blessing on my life. I, I don't say this arrogantly, but I'm blessed today. For the most part, I'm blessed in my health. I just got to get smarter and know how to use my body and know when to quit. But I'm blessed in my health. I'm blessed in my finances. I'm blessed in my family. To God be the glory. It's not anything that I did other than to begin to operate under the principles of God. And that's what I want you to do for your family, for your children. I want your children not to just have enough. I want them to have more than enough. I want them to know what it is to be in the blessing of God. I want to know what it is to operate in the favor of God. I, I, want, I want every ministry to be able to get to a place where they don't have to worry about paying their light bill. There's a lot of them don't know how they're going to do that this month, unfortunately. Listen. There's a release that God has for His people. I believe this and I'm closing this morning. There's a release God has for you and your house and your family. 
if we get back to a place of obedience that means this whatever he speaks over your life just be faithful in it if you fall down jump up and dust yourself off and continue on just be obedient to the best that you can be walk in unity with him and his word but also build relationship with those across the aisle I know life's busy but don't just run into the house of God 30 seconds before it starts and run out the house of God 30 seconds after it's over but build relationships with one another get in unity with one another but then also come back to a place and say you know what I'm going to give the tithe but I'm also going to give the offering I'm going to I'm going to give of my time, my talent, my treasure because then there's a commanded blessing. Listen. Because of the blessing of God on my life, my children live a blessed life. Because the blessing doesn't just stop with me, it means that I'm positioned to bless them more in all different types of ways and when we all begin to operate and live under a commanded blessing how much more can we do for our community how much more can we do from the local house of God that's why he says bring to the storehouse because he wants the storehouse to be filled so it can continue to distribute continually I'm not looking to go down to one service a week but I'm looking to get to a place where the doors of this building is open every day of the week It'd be wonderful if it was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just where there's always, there's always something available for the one that's in need. That's where God wants us to be. As we stand all over the house this morning. I know it's a little different this morning. Those of you visiting, thank you for enduring me this morning. But the commanded blessing, the principle living, most of you under the sound of my voice this morning, we've known each other a long time now. You've been with us a long time, and I'm forever grateful. There's not a person in this room, and I believe you know this to be true, that if you was to call me or Sister Russell that we wouldn't stop what we're doing and we would come to your aid and we'd be there and we'd stay as long as we need to. And we do that not out of obligation. We do that because we love you and because we take what we do very seriously. We've given our life to this thing and therefore we've given our life to you. And how I determine whether I'm successful or not is not by a number in a bank account or a building that we build or a trip that we've taken that's not how I judge success success is when I look at you and I look at your family and I see you blessed I see you in good health I see you in good unity and good harmony and I see increase in your life that's like listen they're they're hearing the word and they're they're enacting principles and God's blessing them. That's when we're successful. So today, please do not be offended by what I've shared with you. But understand this, if there's some areas in your life that you're not, that you're not operating in, I'm not judging you. But I'm asking you to just trust God. I'm just asking you to trust God enough to do what you've not normally maybe done and watch God do something extraordinary in your life. Before we pray, I'm going to give you one passage of Scripture. David understood this. Psalmist David. Psalms 37. I'm going to read you 1 through 5, and then verse 18 through 20, and then verse 22. It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb, but trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, 
and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in evil time. And in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, they shall consume away. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they shall be cursed of him. That, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. But please notice, for such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. If you look at that, David simply said this, just trust in him. Do good, commit your ways to him, and you'll see him do some mighty and marvelous things on your behalf. In my time of prayer, in my time of meditation in the time of word, I began to hear the Lord say, I'm desiring to release the commanded blessing over this house in a greater level, but I just need them to just commit and to trust. So today I'm just asking, are you willing to truly trust Him? In the most minute thing, or maybe that thing that really completely stretches you beyond your comfort zone, I know what it's like when the Lord says, I want you to get up and I want you to walk over and I want you to give that man of God a word from me. And that man of God been a man of God for 40 years and I see that man of God at this level and I see myself at this level and I said, God, how am I going to go tell him that you said this? Listen, I, I, I know what it is to be stretched in that manner. I know what it is to have wobbly knees and I go over and say, I feel like the Lord says to say, yeah, I, I've been there. I also know what it's like to sit where you're sitting and all of a sudden the Lord say, I want you to sow a $1,000. And I'm like, uh, there's a whole lot of things I can do with $1,000. But I, I know what it is to do that. I also know what it's like to sit where you're sitting and Somebody be preaching, the Lord say, you're going to have a service and you're going to pay off that guy's property. And I'm like, uh, there ain't no way. I know what he owes on that property. And I saw because of operating in obedience, completely trusting, committing my ways to him and committing everything that I had to him, I saw God do some amazing supernatural things. And that's what I want for you. That's what I want you for your family. More importantly than me, that's what God wants for you. He just wants to command a blessing over you. So today, as we pray together before we leave this morning, I want you to just say, God, I give you, I give you my life. I just give you everything. Maybe you've struggled with that. Maybe you're here today, you serve God, you didn't, and you're just not really... You've just been distracted, all these things. Listen, I'm not questioning your salvation today. I'm just saying, are you positioned where God can speak that blessing over you? If not, there's no time like the present to say, Lord, forgive me. And Lord, from this day forward, with your help, if you'll give me wisdom and knowledge, I'll do what you're telling me to do. <laughs>